morning's Torah portion is called Imor. And Imor means to speak. A lot of times, in the beginning of any passage in Torah, you will hear Le Homer Adonai El Moshe. And the Lord spoke to Moshe, the bar, saying. <coughs> so this is one of the most common introductions. <coughs> Imor is always about speaking. But today, God is uniquely speaking to the priest. He tells Moshe to tell Aaron how the priests should live a life of holiness, how they should observe the holy days, how they should wear certain garments. And we went through all of the symbolism of the priest and related it to our own lives in the Torah portion. But in the Hoff Torah, you're going to see in Ezekiel 44 how God relates to speaking to the priest in speaking specifically to the line of priests who remained holy down through the ages and who taught Israel correctly. And this was called the line of Zadok. So originally, sons of Aaron could be priests. Not all Levites were priests, but all priests were Levites. And those Levites had taken the place of the firstborn of Israel who were meant to be a kingdom of priests to the Lord. Well, you see that not all of those priests remained faithful. And during the time of conquering and oppression by foreign nations, especially the Greeks, they would try to assimilate their pagan doctrines into Judaism. And some of those priests would go along with what the Greeks <coughs> wanted them to do because of fear of death. But the one family line that would not, that had been faithful from the time of David all the way down to the time of the Maccabees and to the time of Yeshua, was the line of Zadok. And that's where our Hoff Torah focuses on today. In the Torah portion, we see Leviticus 21, 22, 23, and 24, each speaking of laws for the priest to be holy in different ways. Chapter 21 talks about the laws of the priest to be holy by not being unclean, by not eating unclean meats, doing unclean things. And chapter 22 covers the laws for the priest to be holy by being set apart from the rest of Israel and the rest of the world. Chapter 23 talks about the laws for being set apart by observing the set apart days of Yah, which are the holy days. And all of these we can internalize for ourselves as we seek to be a kingdom of priests. Leviticus 24 covers the laws for maintaining the holy place, the Mikdash. Well, what's unique about looking at the line of Zadok and this line of Aaron's sons down through the ages and their faithfulness is we're going to see some hidden prophecies pertaining to the Mashiach that most of the world have never seen, that they don't understand. So it's going to be very beautiful to develop the Hoff Torah and how it parallels to the Torah portion. That parallel discusses the various laws that pertain to the priest, the Kohanim, in both the Torah portion and the Hoff Torah. Ezekiel prophesies in chapter 44 in our Hoff Torah about the service of the Kohanim in the Millennial Temple, which will be rebuilt after the final redemption. The prophet describes the priestly vestments, their personal care, whom they may and may not marry, and their special purity requirements, which preclude them from coming in contact with a dead corpse, unless it is to take care of a next of kin. Ezekiel also discusses their calling as teachers and spiritual leaders. This is the purpose of the priest, to rightly be able to divide the word. In so doing, they're also called judges because to judge is not to point the finger at somebody, but to be able to rightly divide the word of God and share, no matter what the situation is in life. The prophet conveys God's word. You shall give them no possession in Israel, for I am their possession, the Lord says. The Kohanim do not receive a portion in the land of Israel. Instead, they partake of the sacrifices as well as the various tithes. In Ezekiel 44, if you have your Bibles, turn to verse 15 with me. And this Haftor is very short, but it is full of depth that we're going to expound upon. It's only 16 verses, from 15 to 31. 
it starts off saying, but the Levitical priest, specifically the sons of Zadok, who kept the charge of my sanctuary when the people of Israel went astray from me, shall come near to minister to me. So this is a key statement here, so loaded, because one is telling you that now all of these priests are specifically going to be the Zadok line that can come near to the Lord, which means those are the only ones that can officiate as the high priest and enter into the most holy place. Well, with our understanding of Messiah, Yeshua, all of a sudden you say, since God's word will not return to him void, this has to apply to Messiah Yeshua as well. How can any priest come near to God unless they are of the Zadok line? Since God's word has now been established that only the Zadok line from here on out will keep charge of his sanctuary, for one, they will be the ones who are faithful even when Israel goes astray, two, so in a way they're an example of being an overcomer, just like Yeshua was, and they're the only ones that can come near to the Father to present the blood of the sacrifice to minister to him. And they shall stand before me to offer to me the, the fat of the blood I mean, the fat and the blood, declares the Lord. <clears throat> they shall enter my sanctuary, and they shall approach my table to minister to me, and they shall keep my charge. So we should understand who Zadok is. Because if Zadok was such a righteous man, that God says, now only those through his line will come to draw near to me, to approach me, it's important to look at that as an example to follow Zadok's example and the word Zadok comes from the Hebrew word Zadik and we all want to be Zadik say amen which means righteous people the right the Zadik <clears throat> in Hebrew looks like a praying man it's the one letter that looks like a guy is kneeling with his hands up praying for the Lord in humbleness this is the letter that starts Zadok's name. Zadok, or you might have heard Malki Zadik. Malki meaning king, Zadik meaning righteousness. Who was called Malki Zadik, king of righteousness? In English, you call him Melchizedek. Now, Yeshua is to officiate in the order of Melchizedek also, Malki Zadik, which is not just a person, but a title of a king who is also a high priest officiating in righteousness for the people. When David first set up his cabinet, Zadok and Ahimelech, the son of Abithar, were named as priests. Zadok aided King David during the revolt of his son Absalom, who was subsequently instrumental in bringing Solomon to the throne and officiated at Solomon's coronation. After Solomon's building of the first temple in Jerusalem, Zadok was the first high priest to serve there. And there is over 60 high priests down through from the temple being built down to Yeshua's time, all through Zadok's line. Many people don't realize all those high priests were Zadok's <coughs> offspring. Zadok's name means <coughs> one who proved righteous. And what a great name for a high priest, because this is the model that Yeshua exemplified as well. First Chronicles 12.1 says, Now these are they that came to David to Ziklag, and Zadok, and it goes through a list of people who came to him, and then in verse 28 it says, And Zadok, a young man, mighty of valor, and of his father's house, twenty and two captains. So Zadok was the first young priest to recognize God's anointing on David, which is very interesting. Because as we are seeking to be a kingdom of priests, we have a unique identifier. John saw in vision the final generation of Israel awakening holding on to the commandments of God and having the testimony of Yeshua, which means there's a few descended from Israel who recognize by faith the anointing on the king who will sit on David's throne, Yeshua. So we are like Zadok in that way, to recognize God's anointing on the one who would sit as a king and a priest. Men were fleeing to David in his day, coming from all over to join his forces. Zadok recognized that the spirit had left Saul, and his ministry was now all hype and 
flesh with no call or touch of heaven. And Zadok said, I don't want any part of that kind of ministry. It's dead. God has gone from it. I'm going with David, who has the Spirit's anointing. So Zadok went to David at Ziklag, and never to leave him again for the rest of his life. He was completely faithful. Through every rebellion, Zadok stood with him. A man proved righteous. David had captured the priest's heart, and Zadok never looked back. So we're going to look at a parallel of Zadok as a model or an example for us in being faithful to God and recognizing his anointed one, but also there's a special hidden prophecy of Yeshua coming through the line of Zadok as well and fulfilling that faithful priesthood. As a kingdom of priests, we need a faithful high priest. 1 Samuel 2.35 says, I will raise... I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in my heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house. Whenever the scriptures talk about a house or a palace, it's literally talking about the temple, the mikdash. So God is saying he's going to raise up a faithful priest. This is very similar to Deuteronomy 18 where God tells Moses, I'm going to raise up a faithful priest prophet like unto you, Moshe, who's going to be meek and humble, and I'll put my words in his mouth. So the Messiah has to be a prophet, fulfilling Deuteronomy 18, but he also has to be a faithful priest. God has prophesied through the prophet Samuel, and it is this faithful prophet priest who he will build the ultimate temple for, for the Messianic age. And he shall walk before mine anointed forever. So this isn't just talking about an earthly or a human person. This is talking about God's special anointed, if he's going to walk before his anointed forever. Jeremiah 3.14 says, Turn, O backsliding children. He's calling to all of us as descendants of Israel. Return to Shuba, and I will bring you to Zion. We sang this this morning. And I will give you shepherds according to my heart. This is beautiful. You know, the word pastor comes from pastoral or putting the sheep out to pasture, taking care of them. It's literally talking about God's anointed shepherds who will lead Israel as they awaken back to the truth in Torah. But there's false shepherds out there that would like you to think that Torah is done away with. So you have to be wise in understanding not only a faithful priest, as our example of the priesthood, but faithful shepherd for the model of those that will lead Israel. He says that these faithful shepherds will speak according to his heart, and they will feed you with knowledge and with understanding. Da'at and Bina. In our Hathor today, Ezekiel prophesied that a Zadok priesthood would be very much alive and well in the last days. He says in verse 15 and 16, The sons of Zadok that kept the charge of my sanctuary, when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to me to minister to me. They shall stand before me to offer unto me the fat and the blood, says the Lord God. They shall enter into my sanctuary, and they shall come near to my table to minister unto me, and they shall keep my charge. Verse 17 says, They shall be clothed with linen garments. No wool shall come upon them while they minister with their linen garments. So no mixture this is hinting at. There's not going to be any mixture in the true priesthood. Wool represents the animal or the lower self, the flesh. When you mix it with linen, it represents this lower self mixed with the higher self. A little bit of God and a little bit of flesh. But God says, my priesthood is made of pure linen. There shouldn't be any mixture. We should seek to align ourselves with the higher principles of God's consciousness in us, not that which feeds the flesh any longer. Verse 18 says, they shall have linen turbans on their heads and linen undergarments around their waists. They shall not bind themselves with anything that causes sweat. And when they go out into the outer court to the people, they shall put off the garments in which they had been ministering and lay them in the holy chambers. And they shall put on other garments, lest they transmit holiness to the people with their garments. Now remember, we're in chapter 44, so anything from Ezekiel 39 
through 48 is talking about the Messianic Age, the Millennial Kingdom. So this isn't just a instructions about the Zadoks in the past. This is instructions when the temple is rebuilt in the Messianic Kingdom, Messiah is going to have a priesthood. And they're going to be of the line of Zadok. And they're going to be following these instructions. These ten chapters are beautiful in Ezekiel. They tell you all the dimensions of the holy temple, how the priests are going to officiate, the sacrifices that they're going to be bringing, all of these things. I encourage you, if you're not familiar or didn't realize that Ezekiel 40 through 48, we're talking about the millennial kingdom, read it in your spare time. So be thinking about this as we read this. They shall not shave their heads or let their locks grow long. They shall surely trim the hair of their heads. So no shaved heads like the pagans or not having long hair. They're going to have their hair trimmed. No priest shall drink wine when he enters into the inner court. They shall not marry a widow or a divorced woman, but only virgins of the offspring of the house of Israel. Or a widow who is the widow of a priest. They shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the common. This is one of the reasons why we set apart Shabbat. It's one of the first things that Israel comes back into a knowledge of, setting apart the holy from the common, and to show them how to distinguish between the clean and the unclean. So this Zadok priesthood will be fearless against sin, and will have power to lead people into righteousness and holiness. Verse 23 says, They shall teach my people the difference between what is holy and what is not. And cause them to discern between what is clean and what is not. These are the marks of the Zadok priesthood. Verse 24 says, in a dispute, they shall act as judges, like we mentioned earlier. Isn't it interesting? You have prophet. Zadok was actually called a seer. Do you know when you read it in Hebrew, the story of David anointing Zadok, he recognized in him something more than just a priest. He said, Hakoen Haroe Ata. Hakoen means the priest. Haroe means the seer. That means you have prophetic insight to see. You're like a prophet. You Ata, you are. So he basically spelled out for him what God revealed to him, what he saw in him. The priest and a seer, you are. And they will act as judges. So we have prophet, priest, seer, judge, all in one entity. And they shall judge it according to my judgments. This means they shall rightly divide the Torah. Torah will be written upon their heart. They know how to apply it in the daily life. We all need people like that. When there's something that we haven't experienced before, a new situation maybe, and we say, you know, I don't see a mitzvah, a commandment for this specific thing that I'm dealing with. So if you don't have an answer for it through prayer and meditation and fasting, who do you go to to get the answer? You go to your rabbi. And he has dealt with all different applications of the Torah. And so in a way, he's acting as a judge. And this is passed down from the time of Moses down to our day. The rabbis are still acting as a type of judge. And anything that's new that they prescribe, maybe due to technology, they didn't have to worry about turning on lights back in ancient Israel, um, maybe it has to do with new medicine or advances in science. Well, what do we do? We write it down. And if a rabbi doesn't have an answer, he will go to the rabbi who taught him. Because there's always a hierarchy until you find the answer. And you make a judgment on how this should be lived out, how this should be applied. And it gets written into a book called the Gemara. And that the Gemara is part of the Talmud now. But originally it was just the Mishnah. Now the Talmud is Mishnah and Gemara, which is the ancient oral practices that God gave ancient Israel, as well as these new things that deal with situations as science and technology increases. And so it's wonderful to read the Gemara and see all these past questions that have been brought to past sages and to see their answers, and then it gives us more understanding. He says, they shall keep my laws and my statutes in all my appointed feasts. So once again, just like the Torah portion, it's relating to the holy days as a very important factor of being holy. And they shall keep my Sabbath holy. They shall not defile themselves by going near to a dead person. However, for their father or mother or their son or daughter or for a brother or unmarried sister, they may defile themselves. After then they have become clean, they shall count for them seven days. 
And on the day that he goes into the holy place, into the holy court to minister into the holy place, he shall offer his own sin offering, declares the Lord God. This shall be their inheritance. I am their inheritance. Isn't that beautiful? God is saying, rather than worry about the land and what it can produce for you and how it can take care of you, what house you can build in it, I am going to be your inheritance. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to provide all your needs. And my house will be your house. You'll live in my temple. It's so beautiful. Who wouldn't want to be a Zadok priest? And you shall give them no possession in Israel. I am their possession. They shall eat the grain offering, the sin offering, and the guilt offering. And every devoted thing in Israel shall be theirs. And the first of all, the first of all kinds and every offering of all kinds from all your offerings shall belong to the priest. You shall also give to the priest the first of your dough, that a blessing may rest on your house. The priest shall not eat of anything, whether bird or beast, that has died of itself or is torn by wild animals. So this is where the Torah portion ends. It's all focused on the Zadok priest. Now we can easily parallel that with God speaking to the priest in the Torah portion, but I want to take it further for you this morning in our high priest, Messiah Yeshua. There's five scripture references from Ezekiel 40 through 48 where God speaks of changing the whole Aaronic priesthood and clearly declares that of all the sons of Aaron, only the sons of Zadok in the millennial kingdom would be God's priest allowed to come into God's presence and to minister the blood sacrifice before the Lord. So if this is a requirement for the priest, shouldn't this also be a requirement for the high priest? So we have to... Now look at Yeshua through this lens and see if he fits the model. He's our Passover lamb. And he ascended to heaven to minister the blood sacrifice before his father. So having read these messianic prophecies of the Old Testament, which indicate that the Messiah would be the fulfillment of the high priest family of Zadok of the Aaron priesthood, besides being from the family or seed of David through Judah. Now, you know that Aaron came through what tribe? Levi. And David came through what tribe? Judah. So this means the true Messiah has to come through both tribal lineages, which is difficult if a family has only married within their own tribe or if you lose the records of our ancestors and you don't have that to prove it. So since the temple has been built, first and foremost, the temple housed the records of all the genealogies going all the way back to Adam. When the temple was destroyed, those records were lost. So this also has to be a person that lived or existed before the temple was destroyed. And it has to come through both lines. So let's see how it fits. We're going to see a great mystery revealed of just how Yeshua, the king and high priest of heaven, was also the fulfillment of the Zadok high priest family of the Aaronic priesthood. But before we can, it's extremely important to understand that with the removal of the Zadok high priest family by the Maccabees about 160 BC from their rightful position of authority as high priest of the Jerusalem temple and the corruption of the Aaronic priesthood, which followed all in violation of the word of God, that those who were of this high priest family of Zadok hid their identities because the Greeks were against them. They had put other people in the place of the priesthood, and these Zadok priests oftentimes either hid their lineage or retreated out to the Qumran caves, like um, the Essenes were part of that ori original Zadok line, which tells you why John the Baptist spent so much time out there with the Essenes. Very interesting. We're going to see this even in the story of Zechariah and Elisheva, why his lineage was hidden. And this also includes Mary. For in the days of King Herod, if the real Zadok high priest and his family had been found out, they would all most likely have been killed. High priest Annas and Caiaphas were Roman politically appointed positions. 
the real question behind the scene, which opens up the New Testament in Luke 1, is just how would God restore his high priest position to the Zadok line? And this is why those lineages are listed in Matthew 1 and in Luke 2. Many people don't realize Matthew 1 is talking about Joseph, Mary's husband's lineage, not because a priest could come through him, because he comes through the line of Solomon, in which God declared no descendant of like jo Joachim, these uh, unfaithful, wicked priests, could ever have a son that sits on the throne of David. And so God had declared it. That means he couldn't have a literal son. And, but he had to be Torah observant. What it's showing is that he came from the line of Judah, and Mary's going to marry him as she came through the line of Judah. And so they're being Torah observant. Mary is actually living out Torah. That's the purpose of showing Matthew 1. But the purpose of showing Luke 2 lineage is showing Mary's lineage not just comes from the line of David, but it also comes from the line of Levi. And this is where we understand the story of Elizabeth being her cousin, and she's married this high priest. And we'll look at that in a little more detail in a little bit. Unless God somehow miraculously intervened by giving a son to this high priest family of Zadok, the family could not continue. But this Zadok high priest family had to continue, according to Scripture, to fulfill what we read in our Hoff Torah, the divine plan for Messiah's coming to earth as the prophet like unto Moshe, as well as the high priest in the millennial kingdom of the Zadok lion. But how would God cause all this to happen? For the real Zadok high priest needed to one day pass the mantle of his priestly authority to whoever this Messiah would be. Yes, Michael. Okay, so the argument I've had lately, and I've talked to some of friends of mine, is that he fulfills all the prophecies. Uh huh. Right? Shiat, Manah, Gehenna, but when it comes to the Zadok family, they don't have the Actually, he did come from David, and I'll show you how in a little bit. So this will help you. We're going to show three different lineages that Yeshua came from, literally, not just spiritually, because it's so easy to say things in a spiritual way. Oh, he spiritually did this, he spiritually did that. Just like the church says, we're spiritual Israel. And in that way, you replace certain very important principles that are literal in the scriptures. He literally came through the loins of Melchizedek. He literally came through the loins of David, and he literally came through the loins of Zadok. All three lines, through Aaron's priestly line, through Levi. Now, how could one person fulfill all of these in addition to the other prophecies pertaining to Abraham and to Eve? And we will look at that as we go along. The mystery Zadok high priest and his wife had been hiding their identity in the first century for many years. They had no children, no son to pass on this high priest mantle of authority to for their next generation. Because his wife was barren and both were well advanced in years, what would God do? This is the opening scene of the renewed covenant, which would be the catalyst that changed the world. And you can read about this in Luke 1, 5 through 20. The priest, Zechariah, had drawn the lot to serve God on the altar of incense. Now, only somebody who was of the Zadok line who um, was in line to be the high priest could even officiate at the altar of incense. Then, when it was your turn to officiate as the high priest, it had to be by divine recognition. So that's why they drew lots. And what God was saying is it's time to reveal who is the true Zadok priest amongst all these other priests who are doing their course, who is really the one that fulfills the Zadok line. And so Zechariah drew this lot. Every day, morning, and evening for the last 160 years or more, a different priest had served God at this position at the altar of incense most in violation of God's word from Ezekiel, because remember it was about 160 years before that they removed the true Zadok priesthood from the temple, but there was still one left who was incognito, and that's Zechariah. The Greeks didn't recognize that there was one true still in place. This day something different happened. God sent his angel Gabriel to speak to a priest as he ministered at the altar of incense to tell Zechariah two special things. One, that he was going to have a son to carry on the Zadok line, and that his son would be called Yochanan. Now, what's interesting about 
this one of only four people in the scriptures that God tells you the name of who your son shall be called. Yochanan, 160 years before, was the last high priest of the Zadok line before they got removed. So what God is doing is saying, I'm now going to continue this pure Zadok line, and he's going to be the one to have the authority to pass this mantle on to someone else. And of course, we know the rest of the story, who Yochanan passed that mantle to. And that was at the anointing of Yeshua. So this is why Yochanan, even this name John, if you looked back with me through the genealogies of the Zadok line, you would see two very common reoccurring names. Yochanan is one of them of the Zadok priestly line, and Yeshua. Yeshua was not the only one called Yeshua. There was other Yeshuas in that Zadok line. So the angel Gabriel announces this amazing revelation to Zechariah and then takes away his ability to speak so that he, in his excitement, can't <laughs> share this and then, in so doing, be exposed to the Romans and be taken out of position. So for the next nine months, until his son's circumcision, his voice did not return. God will never lie nor confuse us. If we understand the scriptures in their rightful place, we'll understand exactly what God has been doing down through the ages from the very first prophecy in Genesis 3.15 that the world would be blessed through the seed of the woman. Remember, it's the seed of the woman that would bruise the serpent's head. So we're going to see in this understanding of Zadok how in multiple ways God uses a woman to bring the blessing of the true Zadok high priest into place, all the way from Eve down. After 160 years of temple corruption, God was pointing out the real mystery Zadok high priest, which was Zechariah. How do we know this? In Exodus 30, verse 7, God tells us in his word the position of serving God at the altar of incense belonged to priest Aaron and his future son, who would next serve as high priest. By sending his angel while Zechariah was serving God at this altar of incense position, God was telling us, everyone who reads the story afterwards, clearly who this priest Zechariah really was. God, in recognizing priest Zechariah at the high priest position, was saying loudly, this is my priest who has the right to minister to me at this position. God was also telling him through his angel Gabriel that he would have a son so that the line of Zadok high priest would now be able to continue. Also, just why this special son, who 30 years later would begin his service as the next Zadok high priest, had to become named Yochanan, as I shared with you. Now, a priest didn't begin the official service um, of ministering until 30 years old. So even Yochanan was fulfilling Torah by waiting until he was 30, and he was six months older than Yeshua. And so that's why there's that six months gap where he's got disciples before Yeshua has disciples. Yeshua who awaits to take disciples until he turns 30 also. And then he's entering into a high priestly type of ministry uh, at 30 years old. So in our Hoff Torah, we read that God in the Millennial Kingdom is only going to acknowledge the high priest from the sons of Zadok. God told us about Yochanan's parents. Priest Zechariah and his wife Elisheva were both of the line of Aaron and righteous before God, walking in all the ordinances of the Lord, blameless, in Luke 1, verse 5 and 6. This is an amazing statement from God because Zadok means righteous. So when he's saying that Zechariah is a Zadok or a Zadik, as we mentioned, he's saying he is not only a righteous person, but he's of this line of Zadok from Aaron. Both were mikvah and filled with the Ruach HaKodesh. Elisheva, while Yochanan was in her womb, and Zechariah at the time when he named his son Yochanan at the son's circumcision. Listen to Zechariah's words. He says, at his uh, circumcision of John, he shall serve him in holiness and in Zadok, in righteousness. So he's actually anointing Yochanan as the next in line official high priest of the line of Zadok. 
Now only a high priest can pass this mantle on to someone else, just like a prophet would pass the prophet Elijah prof, uh, passed on his mantle to Elisha. Same way, Yochanan is now going to have the authority to pass this mantle of the high priest instead of him fulfilling it on to someone else. The next miracle God did was to give divine conception of a child, a son, to a virgin named Miriam, who was betrothed to a man of the tribe of Judah. Hebrew scripture says Miriam was a close relative of Elisheva because Miriam was of the same Zadok high priest line as Elisheva. So if you look, she can only marry somebody from the line of David if she's from the line of David. But she can only be related to Zechariah and Elisheva if she somehow also has this same lineage in her. How can that be? What's interesting, she had a father, Miriam had a father named Haley. And he was a prince of the line of David. But Haley, because he was a prince, he was allowed to marry outside of his tribe. And he married a woman named Hannah. And Hannah was a daughter of a high priest. This mother and this father is what made Miriam the perfect recipient for God to use. In addition to her holiness, her mother's line had the Levitical line. Her father's line had the scepter that shall not depart from Judah. In this way, her seed could be priest and king perfectly and fulfill. What's interesting is Judah, how did he, he have two sons, Zerah and Perez? He had relations with a woman named Tamar. Who was Tamar? the granddaughter of Melchizedek. Judah had gotten her as a wife for his sons, but his sons, because he had married a Canaanite woman, his sons were not holy, and they weren't fit to take, to produce priestly line. And so what did God do? He didn't let them conceive. He didn't let them consummate the marriage with Tamar. So Tamar goes and sits back in her father's town with the veil over her head, and Judah later finds her and thinks that she's a prostitute and has relations with her, and she knows who he is. They are the ones that have the line of David. So Yeshua literally comes from the line of Melchizedek as well as Judah as well as Levi, as well as Zadok. And through a woman, he had said that the world would be blessed. Eve, in Genesis 3.15, this promise that the one who would come, would come through a woman, we see that Tamar is a woman, Eve is a woman, and Miriam is a woman. Three specific ladies who had key parts to play in Yeshua being all things to all people and fulfilling all of the prophecies. Miriam it can be betrothed to a man of the house of David because her father comes from the house of David. The Hebrew scripture says Miriam was a close relative of Elisheva in Luke 1, 36, because Miriam was from the same Zadok high priestly line through her mother, Hannah. That was Miriam's family secret, which God has now revealed. God wants this truth to be released so that the whole body can understand it. And even the Jewish world can start to recognize Yeshua. And it's not going to be totally understood until he comes and they recognize him themselves. When he comes to fulfill his right as the king of the throne of David, and he returns the exiles of Israel and rebuilds the temple, then all of the Jews and all of the house of Israel and all of the world and every knee shall bow and recognize Yeshua as king of kings and lord of lords. <laughs> Yes, 
yeah, from, from our, our temple, temple records, records um, in, in, that's, that's one of the things about, about the beautiful about the Jewish nation is they have preserved all of these different uh, family trees and family lines, as well as of the high priestly line. Zechariah was the mystery Zadok high priest, so Miriam also carried in her womb the seed for the highest position of this Zadok high priest family. God had so amazingly done it all, arranging all the details in absolute perfection. And this will be a sign to you, it is said in Luke. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in the sukkah. So it was at the first day of Sukkot that they were in Bethlehem. And sukkah means to tabernacle. And literally the word is tabernacling within human flesh on the day of tabernacling. And he's born in the house of bread, Beit Lachem, as the living bread. And he's wrapped in swaddling clothes, which are the used undergarments of the high priest, because he is the next high priest in line. And so even at his birth, all three of these elements are coming into place. Most likely these swaddling clothes were Zechariah's, you know, the undergarments of the priest that were linen. When they were soiled, they would be torn into strips. Some of those strips would be used as the wicks in the menorah. And he's the light of the world. Literally, the spirit can flow through those wicks and give light. And it's what a priest would wrap themselves in, the linen. So he has all of this happening even at his birth. Was this babe wrapped in his uncle's high priestly garments? Most likely. The Old Testament Messianic scriptures prophesied that the prophesied promised Messiah was of the seed of Eve from Genesis 3.15. This seed would carry the fulfillment of two special tribes of Israel, both Judah and Levi, the line of kings and the line of the Zadok high priests. Yeshua had appeared in the word, sent to bless the seed in the loins of Abraham in Genesis 14, 18. Our great king and high priest Yeshua has fulfilled these messianic scriptures concerning himself. But just how can all this be proven? Well, there's lots of documentation. We could take hours and hours talking about the different cycle of the priest, talking about Zechariah, his lineage, Miriam, her lineage. But we will just, in brevity, cover a few aspects here this morning. Because we all value the blood of Yeshua shed for the forgiveness of our sins, it brings us into eternal life forever with God, our Father. The word from heaven had changed the whole Aaronic priesthood. It had placed the Zadok priest in authority as his high priest over all the other families of the Aaronic priesthood, as well as over all the other children of Israel. God specifically stated that only sons of high priest Zadok would be able to minister to God, to come into the presence of God, and to offer the blood sacrifice. So imagine, after his sacrifice, Remember when he says, do not touch me, I have not yet ascended to my father? He had to present the blood to his father. But he could only present the blood of the sacrifice if he was of the Zadok line, according to scripture. Yeshua, as the living Torah, is not going to break Torah just because it's inconvenient. He's going to fulfill it in every single point. God specifically stated that only the sons of the high priest Zadok would be able to minister to God, to come into the presence of God, and to offer the blood sacrifice. So we're going to look at these changes that God made to the Aaronic priesthood, looking specifically at two of these five scriptures about the Zadok in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel 43, right before our Haftar this morning, it states... And he said to me, Son of man, thus says the Lord God, these are the ordinances for the altar on the day when it is made, for sacrificing burnt offerings on it, and for sprinkling blood on it. Now the, high, the most holy place is a symbol, a type, of what is in heaven, of the very throne room of heaven. So when you enter into the most holy place, one, you have to be a high priest, Two, to offer or to sprinkle the blood, you have to be of Zadok's line. So you can see what Yeshua is actually doing as being raised from the grave as the first fruits, as the wave offering before the Father that was always symbolized at the time of the barley wave offering. And then he's arising and ascending as not just any high priest, 
of the order of Melchizedek, which a lot of people up to this time have just said, well, he's of the order of Melchizedek spiritually. They haven't, one, understood that he's literally of the order of Melchizedek, and two, that he's literally fulfilling Torah by being of the line of Zadok to be able to sprinkle the blood in the most holy place in the heavenly throne room, most holy place. It says, you shall give a young bull for a sin offering to the priest, the Levites, who are of the seed of Zadok, who approach me to minister to me, says the Lord God. And in our Hoff Torah this morning, it says, the priest, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, who kept charge of my sanctuary, when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near me to minister to me. They shall stand before me to offer to me the fat and the blood, says the Lord God. God said that a blood offering to be accepted by him would now only come from a son of Zadok. Question, would Yeshua himself also keep these same decrees and ordinances by which the word changed the whole Aaronic priesthood, bringing special authority to only the sons of the high priest Zadok? Yes, in every point, to be a perfect sacrifice, he had to not sin in one area. And the definition of sin in accordance with 1 John 3, 4 is sin is the transgression of the Torah. So he wouldn't even be a fit sacrifice or high priest or his blood wouldn't atone for our sins if he wasn't of the Zadok line. That's how serious it is. And that's what's so beautiful about what God's revealing now about even how perfectly he brought Yeshua, and only Yeshua could have fit this model. No one else could fit the bill of being the future Messiah. The only reason why the Jews are not recognizing him currently is because they're awaiting for the rest of the prophecies to be fulfilled. Yes, he was the prophet like unto Moshe. He is the priest after the order of Melchizedek, and yes, he came through the priestly line, and he's of the line of David, but he has to set up his authority, God's kingdom on earth, return the exiles of Israel, and protect his people from their oppressors and rebuild the temple. When he comes to do that, everyone will recognize him. And then they will begin to understand more fully the nuances of what God was doing by bringing him through this exact line on both sides of his family tree. Yeshua himself came into the presence of his Father and God in heaven when he brought his shed blood offering to the mercy seat in heaven as the high priest's sin offering to be accepted on our behalf for all of our sins, for your sins, for my sins. For Yeshua to bring his blood before his Father in heaven, he had to qualify by the same rules which God gave to his priests, the sons of Zadok. For his blood to be accepted for our sins, he had to pass the exact same qualifications that we read both in the Torah and in the prophets today on this very Torah portion. Yeshua, besides being priest of God most high, he also had to be a son of the Zadok priest family on earth. He also had to be of the seed of Zadok for his blood sacrifice to be accepted by his father in heaven. This is beautifully profound. In our Hof Torah, it says that only the sons of Zadok can come into the presence of God. Yeshua is priest of God Most High, but through the seed from his mother, Miriam, he is also a son of the Zadok high priest family, and therefore he qualifies to bring his blood into heaven and to set it before his Father's presence on our behalf. I find this to be so beautiful. There is no accidents. Just as Yeshua, you know, when you became a believer, and you started studying the scriptures, probably one of the first Bible studies you saw was how Yeshua fulfilled all of the prophecies pertaining to his first coming as being the prophet like unto Moshe, the suffering servant, the place where he'd be born. All these things he fulfilled point by point. Well, in his second coming, even in his ascension, there was so much that people didn't realize that he had to fulfill point by point, even to be able to ascend and present the blood sacrifice before the Father, and then to return as the Mashiach who will reign as high priest and king, a dual office on his throne. It's so much more beautifully unfolding than we even ever realized. 
in John 20, verse 17 is the text that I mentioned earlier, where he told them, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. Remember, the priest could not be unclean. If a woman touches a priest when she's in her cycle of nidah, it makes him unclean also. Then he cannot go into the most holy place and sprinkle the blood. So he's not saying anything mean. He's just saying everything in accordance with Torah. Please don't do anything that would make me unclean. I haven't yet ascended to my father. I have to go and present this blood on your behalf. Now this text in John 20, verse 17, takes on a whole new significance of how deep it is because think of one thing thwarting this perfect sacrifice, atoning for our sins. Yeshua, the king of righteousness, was the perfect physical fulfillment of this righteous seed which ran through two tribes, Judah and Levi. This seed showed up in Noah, in Genesis 7, 1. Then Abraham, and I could have put Noah in here, but just for the sake of brevity, I kept it short. Literally going through this line, you're seeing this prophesied seed. And the days of Noah, there was a problem with seed. Seed was being contaminated. So much so that God says, Noah is the only one left righteous in all his lineage. In the English Bible, it gets translated as in his generation, but it means in his lineage. It was literally a concern that Mashiach would not be able to come into the world if there was no one left without contaminated seed. So God allowed the world to be cleansed at that time and save Noah and his family. And through Noah, who was Noah's son? Shem. Who? Because he was born before the flood, 100 years before the flood, after the flood, he's got this antediluvian blood. He's living like 800 years after the flood. And people say, we don't know who his father or his mother was. My father knew him. My grandfather knew him. My great-grandfather knew him. This guy's always been around. We don't know. He's teaching the principles of righteousness from Salem. This is before this was called Jerusalem. And he's known as a king of righteousness. This is not a name. This is a title for Shem, who was officiating as a high priest, atoning for God's people and teaching. He's awaiting the perfect seed so he can teach these principles because they don't know when Mashiach is going to come. And he has to wait. Guess how many generations? Noah is what generation from Adam? Ten. Shem would then be eleven. He has to wait another 10 generations before Abraham comes on the scene. Because even though his son Eber helps him in his yeshiva in Salem, that's not the one to pass on the oracles of God to. The next one in line who was righteous, who believed in the one true God, was Abraham. So Terah didn't get taught by Melchizedek. Terah's father didn't get taught by Melchizedek. But Abraham after being hidden in a cave for 10 years from Nimrod, spent 40 years with Melchizedek, learning all the oracles that had been passed down from Adam and Enoch through his father Noah, so that he could be a righteous high priest, and someone from his lineage could then be Mashiach. And yet, he doesn't, Melchizedek doesn't die at the time of Abraham, so the high priestly mantle does not get passed on to Abraham. It goes, and his son gets taught, Yitzhak. But Melchizedek still lives through Isaac's life. And he gets passed on to Jacob. Now, Jacob's unique because Melchizedek dies during the years of Jacob. After teaching Jacob, it's then Jacob that <coughs> is revealed by divine inspiration that for the first time, the firstborn blessing should be divided up into three different segments. There's a double portion of wealth which went to Joseph's family. Ephraim got the firstborn blessing. The priesthood, it was revealed through divine inspiration, should go to Levi alone. And the scepter for rulership should go to Judah. And so you see that this beautiful priestly line from Adam all the way down came through Shem and Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, and then was split up so that God could preserve a lineage for the Messiah, in case one or the other got wiped out, there was intermarriage between Judah and the line of Melchizedek, between D David's line and Levi, and it comes all the way down into Yeshua so beautifully. He's the perfect 
fulfillment, the righteous seed, which ran through all of these lions. This seed showed up from the very beginning, went through Noah, Abraham, Melchizedek, down through Isaac and Jacob, even through Aaron's grandsons, Phinehas of Eliezer. And then we see it in King David and his seed in Psalms 110, verse 4, and in the high priest Zadok and his seed. Last, we see it in Yochanan. And then we see Yochanan pass this mantle to Yeshua. He says, Yeshua, there's one that's coming that is greater than I. I'm not even fit to tie his sandal. And at his mikvah, he anoints him. It's a type of anointing and passing of that mantle in order to fulfill all righteousness. This is the king-priest mystery fulfilled in Yeshua that is only hinted at when you read Ezekiel 44 or Hoff Torah. Then when you develop it more with fuller understanding, you see how beautiful and how perfect God has fulfilled Torah through Yeshua, sending his seed, the word made flesh. Yeshua is the fulfillment of three family lines, Malkizadik from Tamar, David's line from Judah, and Zadok's line Levitical lineage. So here is a little family tree just of Mary's family. And if you look down at the bottom, we'll trace our way back up. Most of these people you do not know unless you're a historian, because these were the different um, high priest of Israel. But you have Yeshua. Let's see, is my, I guess my laser is not going to work. And you have two lines through Miriam. His mother's line, Hannah, sometimes called Anna. They oftentimes drop the H. Just like in Spanish, H is silent. Um, you see it with Healy also, her father. Healy becomes recorded in a lot of English translations as Eli, you'll read in her family lineage. So her family is spelled, her father, Davidic prince, Haley, Prince Alexander III, also known as Helios in some um, historical documents. He's the son of Matat, and he's of the line of Judah. Miriam's mother from Levi goes up being sisters with Elisheva and Yane being daughters of a man named Yeshua who was a high priest. He's called Yeshua the third who was the 59th high priest and lived from 36 to 23 BCE. And of course he was the son of Fabet and he was the son of Botas and so on and it goes all the way up. Botas' father, Hananel, he had to flee to Egypt because of the Greek oppression against the true Zadok high priest. And he was the one that in our Jewish documents is reported as being one of the high priests who actually sacrificed the red heifer to purify the temple vessels. So this means he was very knowledgeable. He knew exactly how to use the, the red heifer ashes to purify the temple vessel. But he ended up fleeing to Egypt to avoid death. And so he became known as Hananiel the Egyptian. And this is the unknown lineage of Yeshua that's not ever talked about because this lineage is not mentioned in Matthew 1 or Luke 2. But now, as Paul Harvey used to say, you know the rest of the story. It is what Yeshua inherited genetically from his mother's seed. The seed of Eve prophesied all the way back in Genesis 3.15. The seed of a woman carries the answer to this mystery. Eve and Tamar and Hannah and Miriam. This is what God physically passed into Yeshua through Miriam's seed. Not only the fulfillment of both the line of David's kingship and Zadok's high priesthood in the flesh, but also Miriam's part of this divine love story was to bring forth the one into the earth who carried the three mantles of authority revealed in Genesis 14:18. Priest of God, El Elyon, Melchizedek, remember he paid a tithe to Abraham. Abraham paid a tithe to Melchizedek. Even while Abraham was being recognized by Melchizedek, spiritually anointing him, who was in his loins? All of these 
Judah, even Levi, which shows that Levi is a lesser priesthood than Melchizedek, because Levi was in Abraham's loins when he paid a tithe to Melchizedek. So it's like Levi recognizing a higher authority of priesthood. And yet, Yeshua goes through all three of those. He's known as King of Salem, King of Righteousness, Malki Zadik. Through his mother Miriam's bloodline, as a daughter of Zadok priest, probably granddaughter to the previous mystery Zadok high priest, Yeshua automatically was born a son of Zadok priest. And this is exactly how Yeshua fulfilled all of these prophecies. Luke 1, 76 and 77 says, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the highest. You're the ultimate prophet, because you're the prophet like unto Moshe, fulfilling Deuteronomy 18. God has put his word in your mouth, but you're also a priest of the line of Zadok that can approach the presence of the Father. For you will go before the face of the Lord. If only Zadok can go before the face of the Lord, it's hinting that you're not only a prophet, you're a high priest to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins. I hope this rest of the story has blessed you this morning in conjunction with our Haftorah. It's, there's no accidents and there's no words or numbers used in the scriptures that are not for our deeper understanding. And so it's fun to extrapolate and to dig deeper and say, why, Father, would you now narrow down this priesthood from Aaron's line to just Zadok if Yeshua doesn't fit in? Whenever there's a question like that, we have to search it out. God has given us intelligent minds to ask intelligent questions. And the scripture says, He does nothing unless He reveals His plans through the prophets. This means this was already revealed in the prophets of old. He was already telling us how He would fulfill the plan of salvation through the seed of a woman. With that, let's stand and we'll close in prayer. Abba Father, I thank you for revealing to us in our day as the final generation these amazing glimpses of fulfillment of Yeshua as the Messiah that was the promised seed of a woman that have been hidden from previous generations. Help this information to go forth, Father, and to help others recognize the validity of Yeshua. Even though he didn't set up your kingdom in his first coming, he is coming again. And we can claim all of your promises for just as you fulfilled them point by point in his first coming, you will fulfill them point by point in his second coming. And you have fulfilled them point by point even in his very DNA and in his lineage so that he can be all things to all people. He is a high priest touched with the feeling of our infirmities. And we thank you for sending him, Father. We love you, and we just ask that as we behold your beautiful character as revealed through Yeshua, we would be able to be changed into its likeness so that we would be found as a bride without spot or blemish for Mashiach bridegroom when he comes. We love you, and we thank you for this. In your holy name we pray. Amen.